Ebionite is really an interesting word. You can search the New Testament in vain to find out about the term. It's out there, but never really mentioned in the New Testament. However, in the famous Sermon on the Mount, Jesus does say, blessed are you, plural, poor ones. And Ebionite, Evionim in Hebrew, means the poor ones. And Isaiah is the one who uses the term when he says, God rules heaven and earth and you couldn't build me a house, but I will look to those that are poor in spirit. So we get the phrase, blessed are the poor in spirit. The humble ones, something like that. So who are the humble ones and how would they get a name like that? Other than that reference, and I don't even know if that's a technical capital name, you know, blessed are the Ebionites. I don't think he's talking like that. We get descriptions from their enemies. It's generally the people that hated and disliked them. Later in the third, fourth, and fifth century CE, the so-called church fathers, the main source is Epiphanius, who writes against all heresies. So if we go to Epiphanius, against all heresies, and he's naming all these groups that are of the devil and of Satan, Christian groups, in quotes to him, because he thinks they're all teaching error and so forth. Ebionites are named, as well as Nazarenes. So we're going to talk about Ebionites and Nazarenes. Now, usually the Ebionites are seen as the worst because they reject Paul. He, he says that. They also say Jesus was just a human being. They don't have any virgin birth story. They use the Gospel of Matthew. But guess what? When they start their Matthew, it doesn't have the Christmas story. It just starts out with uh, Jesus teaching and much like Mark. So those first two chapters, according to the sources, and it's not just Epiphanius, other sources like Jerome, they say, oh, they use a Matthew that doesn't have the birth story of Jesus being of a virgin and that sort of thing. So human Jesus, Joseph is the father. Uh, they reject the temple and animal sacrifices. They're vegetarians. Uh, he tells you all of this. And they particularly believe that Jesus became the Christ. They do think he's the Christ, but only at his baptism. So as he grows and lives up to age, what, in his 20s, until he's baptized by John the Baptist, he's just an ordinary human being. He's not really divine at that point, but we'll look at a text later. I'm going to read you some of the actual Evianite texts that we have. And uh, he hears a voice, and the voice doesn't just say, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. That's in our Greek Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You know what it also says? You are my son. This day have I begotten you. And the Holy Spirit comes down. And I guess you could just say begotten impregnates him with the divine essence. So he becomes divine, but as an adult at his baptism. No preexistence, nothing like later Trinitarian theology. So you can see why Epiphanius, Jerome, Augustine, and others would not particularly like the Ebionites. Also, they think Paul is a heretic. I think I mentioned that. They, you know, they don't use the letters of Paul, but they it isn't just that they don't use them. So if you want to get opposite of Marcion, go to an Ebionite. Marcion would say, letters of Paul are everything. Here's my distilled version of the new gospel. And the Ebionites would say, You've got things so backward. You're the extreme version of everything that's wrong. And, of course, Marcin would say that back to them, this Judaizing group and so forth. So sometimes it's called Jewish Christianity, but, you know, that's really a mouthful. Or Judeo-Christian, we have all these hyphenated ways of saying it. Look. The Jesus movement is Jewish. It's a Jewish movement within late Second Temple Judaism. And 
you know, to call it Christianity at an early stage is kind of misleading. And if we're going to try to figure out who they were in, say, the second century, early on, before they were just completely rejected and castigated, or even in the late first century CE, then uh, we can find some more positive references, perhaps. For example, Matthew, in his Greek gospel that we have, says, don't think I came, this is Jesus speaking, don't think I came to destroy the Torah and the prophets. I tell you, whoever looses one of the mitzvot, the commandments of the Torah, will be least in the kingdom, and whoever does and teaches them will be great. Ebionites would love that. They would say, absolutely, and what you're doing with your Gentile Christianity is loosing the Torah and telling Jews that they don't need to observe the Torah. They're preserved not by name, but by ideology in the book of Acts. Remember those believers in the book of Acts, Derek, that kind of dog Paul and they think Paul's too liberal and he's teaching uh, Gentiles the gospel. But remember, their real problem is, at least in the book of Acts, okay, Gentiles, we agree, they can go under what was called the laws of Noah. It's a form of the Torah that's more universal. Don't commit adultery. Don't be an idolater. Don't be sexually immoral. Don't be cruel to animals, that sort of thing. Don't steal. Don't lie. You know, basic laws that would have most cultures would probably agree with. That isn't what they're worried about. They're what they want to say to Paul, but when you're alone with your Jewish followers, do you tell them that they don't have to keep the law? Because then you're contradicting Jesus. Because he said, if you loose the law, then you're going to be least in the kingdom. And that phrase doesn't mean they're going to be there. They're going to be called least by those in the kingdom is the idea. You know, you people rejected God's law. Now, we do have the other term. So let me go to that and then come back to the Ebionites, the poor ones, Nazarenes. Later, the two groups get kind of identified as two forms of Jewish Christianity. One group accepting Paul, the other group rejecting Paul. So in the book of Acts, I think it's Acts chapter 24, when Paul is charged at one of his trials, He's called by the priest, the ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. It's the only time we get that term. But it, he does call it the sect of the Nazarenes. Now, let me stay with that term a little bit, and then we'll go back to the Ebionites. The Nazarenes later are distinguished, I'm talking about 3rd, 4th, 5th century, from the Ebionites by saying that, well, the Nazarenes accept Paul, but they're kind of Jewish-oriented. And they have a me medium Christology, not Trinitarian, you know, so-called really high Christology, like pre-existence and so forth. But they do think he's divine and they worship him and, you know, in their rituals and so forth. And the Ebionites are the more strict ones that reject Paul. So maybe there was kind of a separation later because when Epiphanius describes them, he says there's two groups. One, really bad. The other bad, but, you know, they're, they're not, at least they're not rejecting Paul. And maybe you could say teach a Nazarene, but probably couldn't teach an Ebionite because they're just following the devil, basically. Um, there have been some recent studies that have argued that that dichotomy is probably not valid. You're going to ha have a whole spectrum of diversity in any of these movements. You know, some, when you say accept Paul, reject Paul, Maybe you read Paul differently. You know, someone could read Paul in a more Ebionite way. Like, I personally am not convinced that Paul believed that Jesus pre-existed. So I would be making Paul sort of like an Ebionite or certainly a Nazarene. And I think Paul probably thought Jesus had a human father because he says, of the flesh, he's of the seed of David. Did he think Joseph was the father? Very possibly. He doesn't say who the father was, but he certainly thinks he's a human being, born of a woman and so forth. 
So you see, just to say they reject Paul, what interpretation of Paul, what understanding? Yes, they certainly reject the later view of Paul that develops in the early Christianity. But we do have sources about the more strict group, the Ebionites, that are very helpful to kind of flesh out what they might have believed. The main sources, and I really recommend that people read them, you can get them in English translation, are called the Pseudo-Clementines. Pseudo because they're not really written by Clement, but they are very adventuresome and wonderful. But one of the core stories that they preserve is a debate between Peter and Paul. And that is really interesting. And the Pseudo-Clementines, this particular section, claims to come from James, the brother of Jesus. So you've got James, the brother of Jesus, presenting his view of his brother in early Christianity. And guess what? Peter represents the position of a kind of orthodoxy, a Jewish understanding of keeping the commandments that the Ebionites would have liked. And Paul represents the arch heretic who's being rejected. And they're actually having a debate. And you'll be very interested in this debate because you and I have talked a lot about this. What did, did Paul really see Jesus? And in the debate, Peter says, you know, we saw him. We touched him. We walked with him. We knew him. You know, all the human emotions. Like someone would say, I knew this person, right? Very well in the flesh. And we know in Paul's letters, he goes, well, if we once knew Jesus according to the flesh, we don't know him that way any longer. Well, that really fits this text. So Paul says, well, uh, I know him too because I've seen him in heavenly visions. And Peter says in the text, and it's mixed in with Simon Magus. So I, I didn't explain that, but I'm, I'm translating it. It's basically a Peter Paul thing uh, because Simon Magus is presented as the bad guy and Peter is the good guy, but uh, it's basically Paul. And the idea would be Maybe you had a dream or a delusion or what we're going to go by somebody claiming they saw something. We actually knew him. So the pseudo Clementines say, don't believe anything you hear unless it comes from James the just, Jesus' brother. And that would echo what we see in the Gospel of Thomas, where Jesus says, if I go away, there's one person you go to. You want to get the truth. Go to James, the just, for whom heaven and earth were made. You know, like he's a sadiq. This is a Jewish expression for what's called a, a righteous one. The Jews had this tradition that there are 36 righteous all times in the world, and that keeps the world stable because God at least has those sadikim that he can see are good, almost like the Sodom and Gomorrah story. If I find 10, yeah, I'll put up with the evil because it's worth it for those 10. And finally, it gets down to like, we can't even find 10, so the place gets destroyed. So that's sort of the idea behind this, this exaltation of James. But if we go to the New Testament then, we don't get the term, but we have this letter of James, whether James exactly wrote it, most scholars don't think he did. But it's certainly reflecting a James tradition, it seems, having his name on it. And he claims to be, you know, the brother of Jude, who claims to be the brother of Jesus and so forth. And so, you know, the connection between the brothers there. And it's written in really nice Greek. So it is, you do have to wonder, could James have written Greek like this? But go to the content. There is nothing Pauline in that book. In fact, what did Paul say was the main message, the cross of Christ and the blood of Jesus and the gospel and redemption by faith through the blood, Romans 1, 2, 3, you know, 4, 5, as he gives his uh, gospel. James doesn't say any of that. James presents a kind of Jewish piety. So I think uh, James could be a sort of Ebionite book. It's a form of uh, ethical Torah faith. 
with Jesus as the Messiah, with James as the leader, as he says, of the 12 tribes. He writes to the 12 tribes scattered abroad as if he's the Nasi, the prince or the leader of, you know, the new Israel, the Jesus dynasty that I talk about in my book. But as far as the tracing what the Ebionites were down through history, other than what their enemies say, we have to read the text backward because the enemies are just going to damn them and then say, well, what do they really think? We can come up with three or four things. First, they think that Jesus is the true teacher. Uh, I brought a couple of their texts, and I'm actually going to read them to you rather than quote them uh, because I want you to get the feel. This is coming from Jerome, and he's quoting what he calls the Gospel of the Hebrews. You get different names for their version of Matthew. It's basically Matthew. And here's what he says. He says, well, in their gospel, we find the following. So he's writing a commentary on Isaiah. This is Jerome. And as he writes, he says, I've got this Ebionite copy of Matthew, and it, it reads a little differently. As it happened, when the Lord came up out of the water, talking about his baptism, the whole fountain of the Holy Spirit came down on him and rested on him, and it said, My son, I was waiting for you and all the prophets, waiting for you to come so I could rest on you. For you are my rest. You are my first begotten son who rules forever. Later, this is called adoptionism. The idea that Jesus is born of a man, but then he's adopted or taken into the family of God. Paul uses that term when he talks about the followers of Jesus being adopted by the Spirit so that they can become part of the glorified children of God. So I think he believes the same for Jesus. And you and I have talked about that some. We also have another text quotes, quoted by Jerome from that gospel, which is really interesting. You know, James is never mentioned like at the Last Supper or anything like that, unless he's the beloved disciple, which I think he is. So this would reinforce the view that I hold. How it got to be John, the son of Zebedee, I have no idea. You know, did you know that the Gospel of John doesn't even name John, the son of Zebedee? When they're at the Sea of Galilee, right at the end, and see Jesus on the shore, it just says the sons of Zebedee. That's not a very good way to describe this main guy that's supposed to be so important in that Gospel. So who is this beloved disciple? I think it's James. Now, here's a quote from the, Ebionite, the Gospel of the Hebrews. The Lord, after he had given the linen cloth to the priest's slave. What is this? You know, some people, oh, it's like the Shroud of Turan or something. No, nothing like that. Probably something like uh, a linen robe that he wore that is kind of passed on now to James. He went to James and appeared to him. Now, James had sworn not to eat bread from the time that he drank of the Lord's cup. So he was at the Last Supper, according to this memory. James, the brother of Jesus. And he, so he wasn't going to eat until he saw the Lord raised up. And Jesus, the Lord said, bring a table and some bread. So here's a little appearance that we don't have in our Gospels. Paul knows this, though. Remember? Mm -hmm. He says he appeared first to Peter and then James. He must have heard a tradition like this. It's not going to be in the Gospels. Why? They don't want James to be important. Peter needs to take over, right? He's the pillar. Even though Paul says the pillars, the you know central support and leader of the church, James first, then Peter, then John, the son of Zebedee. So he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to James the just. And he said, my brother, eat your bread for the Son of Man has been raised from among those that sleep. So there's a precious little nugget in the Gospel of the Hebrews. So you can see that they have very different traditions. I won't read more, but there's another uh, saying in there that I like from the Gospel of the Ebionites, where he says, unless you cease sacrificing, the wrath of God will not depart from you. Talking about the temple and all of their corruption and so forth. So as we put it together, 
the Ebionites, as they go on down through history, they become marginalized, forgotten. They're Juda Judaizing Christians, kind of just pushed over here to the margins. They think Jesus was anointed of the Spirit. And one of the things they say, it's one of my favorite later texts, that the Spirit hastens through the ages until it can rest upon someone worthy. So this idea of the Spirit coming as a dove and nesting on Jesus' head, you know, symbolically speaking, so that the Spirit is going to permanently dwell in him and he receives the fullness of the Spirit. So we know that they thought that about Jesus. They do believe he was raised from the dead, and they believe he's the firstborn of those who sleep. So they're not that different from Paul in some ways. And they also believe that the temple is corrupt and God never really wanted sacrifices. They quote Jeremiah, in the day I led you out of Egypt, I didn't command you about sacrifices. They also believe the Torah is corrupt. They use the wheat and tares story in the gospels in Matthew 25. And they say that the Jews have sown tares, similar to what Muhammad later said bad seed into the Torah, the priests have done this to get power. Today, modern scholars would call it P, the priestly source. I'll give you an example where King David's praying, you don't want sacrifice, Psalm 51, he's committed adultery, committed murder, you forgive, you're merciful, you're generous. And then at the very end, somebody's added clear interpolation. After he says, you don't want sacrifice, he says, uh, you only want a broken, contrite heart, which is the Ebionite heart, right? Somebody writes, and then we will present sacrifices again. It's like just added on there. And you get that on Isaiah 56, other places where priestly people have put in sacrifices. It's their livelihood. I mean, it's their whole religion. You don't have the power of the priest. What do you have, right? So these Ebionites, they think they're tares. And they, all, they love to quote Jeremiah, where he says, the false pen of the scribes has made the Torah a lie. This is a verse in Jeremiah. Uh, I think it's chapter 7. The false pen of the scribes, they love that. They quote it all the time. And they also believe in being vegetarian then. And so they say that John the Baptist did not even eat locusts. Remember locusts and wild honey? And they say that word actually has been misrepresented in the Greek, but in the Hebrew, it's actually the word for a honey cake. There are two Greek words, agris and akris, sound very much alike. One is locust, the bug, and the other is a kind of a honey desert flower that you can pick and eat like manna. So they actually, uh, there's a saying of Jesus in one of the Ebonite Gospels where he says to his disciples, do you remember in Luke where he says, I've really desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer? That's in Luke, but I won't eat it again. They have that totally different. Do you think I desire to eat meat with you on this Passover? So he's actually saying, I'm not going to eat a Passover lamb. This bread is my lamb. This wine is my blood. We don't need to shed blood in order to celebrate the, the bread or the food that we eat and the wine that we drink that gives us joy. So they completely, they completely changed that. Um, now, could Paul be an Ebionite? I mean, this is like the most shocking thing I've ever asked. It's just like, yes and no. If Paul is writing for Gentiles and telling them to just keep the so-called laws of Noah, and not putting on them the entire Torah, because they're not Jews, that's fine with the Ebionites. So check that off. If Paul thinks Jesus has a human father, and he didn't pre-exist, and he's of the seed of David, literally, had a male father of the seed of David, Ebionites would love that. If he then was anointed with the Spirit, through which he cries, Abba, Father, making him a son, but also you are anointed with the Spirit. He's extending what Jesus had to all the people who follow. 
not like he's ontologically different. You could never identify with him because he's this, you know, logos, pre-existent divine being and so forth. But he's making it more down to earth, as I understand, even passages like Philippians 2. We did a video on that. I think it's on your channel. We talk about that in some detail. I want to talk about it more in the future. So uh, uh, we're, it sounds like we could be getting close. The, the kicker would be, does he tell Jews that they don't have to obey the Torah. But remember, what do you mean by obey the Torah? Because Jesus, for example, says you can let a animal, you help an animal out of a pit on the Sabbath. And the Pharisees and the Essenes would say, or rather the Essenes would say, well, that's hard work. You can't do that on the Sabbath. So when the Ebionites would call it, whoever looses the commandments, and teaches men so, will be called least in the kingdom. But whoever does, does them, could it be talking about keeping the Torah with the intent of the law? Because Paul does talk about the thoughts and intents of the heart. So maybe we shouldn't make the Ebionites some rigid legalistic group that has no feeling for human need. I mean, if the Sabbath was made for people, not people for the Sabbath, is in their Gospel of Matthew, we think. You know, so laws are for people, not people for laws. That seems to be what Paul's mainly about when he, quote, looses the Torah. He's actually pretty liberal with it. You know, uh, he takes the teaching of divorce, for example, and he says, uh, look, the Lord taught no divorce. I agree with that. I'm telling you no divorce. But, but this is very rabbinic. Could there be a circumstance in which you would let the partner go? Yes. If the partner is an unbeliever and utterly refuses to stay with you, what can you do about it is the implication. Let the partner go. A brother or sister is not bound in such a case. Now, I'm not going to go around labeling Paul an Ebionite, but I'd like to say because I think he thinks the end is so near that a lot of this stuff is just passing away. And probably within a year or two, Jesus will return and everything. You won't be asking these human earthly questions anymore. But I just want to make that point to say that what people are calling Jewish Christianity, Judeo-Christianity, or even Ebionite or Nazarene Christianity, Maybe we have turned it into a kind of a Protestant Lutheran view or even an early Catholic view of turning it into this whole new religion called Christianity. In other words, let me end with this. Was Paul a Christian or a Nazarene? Was he not a poor one who emphasized the same kind of virtues? Here's Paul's quote. Have this mind in you that was also in Christ that he humbled himself and took on the form of a slave. Act like that. That's Ebionite behavior. So that's my view of the Ebionites. I want to redeem them. I wish I could have known them. I think they would have been much closer than we know to uh, Jesus and to James and to the early followers.